This presentation is created and presented by Solomon Gamboa and Austin Miller of Indigenous Landscapes. Native plants are plants that are indigenous to a particular region, which for the United States means plants that were naturally here upon arrival of European colonization. Native plants co-evolved with each other and native wildlife and insects to form ecosystems. So this bumblebee here is called the American bumblebee. Uh, the Latin name is Bombus pensylvanicus. And the plant is called Baptisia australis, uh, blue wild indigo. Baptisia species have co-evolved with bumblebees to form really tightly wound uh, flowers that can only be opened by a pollinator as strong as a bumblebee or possibly a carpenter bee. Uh, this is just one example of coevolution. The basis of ecological restoration is the restoration of native plants in the format of a pre-existing ecosystem. This could be forest, woodland, savanna, prairie, or wetland in the eastern U.S. Restoring native plants restores the foundation of the ecosystem because insects co-evolved with the native plants, and once you restore the plants, the insects follow. So let's take wood nettle as an example. <clears throat> so this is a bottomland forest in southwest Ohio. The canopy is box elder, uh, sycamore, cottonwood, American elm, uh, typical alkaline bottomland forest. Uh, the understory is covered in wood nettle, which is pretty common around these parts as well. Um, and these are the insects that we found just searching wood nettle for about three or four minutes um, in about a 20 by 20 patch. Uh, all of these insects um, either are using the wood nettle as cover or uh, using some part of the plant for food. Just returning this one plant to a bottomland forest or bottomland woodland environment invites all these various different kinds of insects back into the habitat. By producing insects and other arthropods like arachnids and crustaceans, this is how native plants restore the foundation of the ecosystem. Native plant agriculture is the implementing of edible native plants as the basis of a primarily perennial agricultural system that mimics native plant communities and format. The goal of MPA is to expand native vegetation back into agricultural land to restore a significant level of biodiversity while improving human food productivity for a changing climate and growing population. Native plant agriculture is all about turning agriculturally caused issues into agricultural solutions. So a few issues caused by agriculture today is biodiversity decline, pollinator decline, the insect apocalypse from habitat loss, water pollution from nutrient runoff, harmful algae blooms, the Gulf of Mexico dead zone, a large proportion of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and oceans come from turning these ecosystems into corn, soy, wheat, alfalfa rotations and cotton rotations, as well as overgrazed pasture. These agriculturally caused issues can be turned into opportunities with native plant agriculture. So with agriculture, habitat loss can be turned into habitat restoration and biodiversity recovery. Because the native plant agricultural system is primarily perennial, it will reduce nutrient runoff and re-sequester greenhouse gases through ecosystem restoration while producing food. 
Plants account for about 82% of the total biomass on Earth and are the foundation of nearly all ecosystems. So when native plants are restored on cropland, the base of the ecosystem is being rebuilt. Native plants are consumed by insects, amphibians, mammals, and birds, acting as the link in the food chain between the energy of the sun and the life forms of the ecosystem. Native insects are the primary consumers of native plants and the bedrock of the food chain. So when native plants are restored on cropland and native insects recolonize the ecosystem, these two most essential parts of the ecology allow wildlife to thrive. The orders of insects on this chart represent the thousands of species of insects that can repopulate the ecosystem once native plants are restored onto cropland. Nearly all baby birds and many mature birds rely on native insects as a primary food source. The soft, easy to digest bodies of some insect larvae make them ideal to feed to baby birds. Most are also high in protein and very nutritious, allowing nestlings to develop quickly and giving them the best chance to survive. Uh, here we have a cardinal feeding its nestling, a, a common yellow throat, a yellow warbler feeding nestlings, and a great crested flycatcher with prey in the beak there. Some mammals specialize in eating insects, while other mammals eat insects opportunistically. The diets of moles and shrews are primarily insects. Gray foxes will eat insects when given the chance, and skunks alter their diet based on the season, eating a wide variety of plants, insects, and other small creatures. Reptiles and amphibians are common predators of insects. The box turtle, shown in the top left, is omnivorous and will eat both plants and insects. Rough green snakes, shown in the top right, prefer to hunt in grasslands and thickets. Spring peepers in the bottom left eat flies, mosquitoes, and other small insects. And blue-spotted salamanders in the bottom right often take worms, slugs, and snails as a meal. So native plant agriculture mimics natural ecosystems, and this takes all the design work out of it. You just have to understand how um, native forests, woodlands, and prairies uh, operate. So with the format that we call woodland, a woodland is basically in between a savanna and a uh, forest. A savanna, um, they typically classify that as having anywhere between 70 to 30 uh, percent tree canopy cover and then prairie and thickets in between, whereas forest has less than 10 percent of the sunlight hitting the ground. And woodland is right there in between, so it's a little bit tight, tighter spaced than a savanna, and then less tighter canopy spaces than a forest. And this allows about 10%, uh, 10 to 20% at the most uh, sunlight to hit the ground in between the trees to create a herbaceous understory. So we put um, native plant agricultural tree crops into a woodland because a savanna lets in too much sun around the trees and then you'll end up having less trees per acre than can actually fit on it. And then we don't use a forest spacing because then the canopies don't turn into all that they can be and they're somewhat minimized and in direct con light competition with each other. A woodland should be this happy medium right in between where you have very large wide space canopies yet they're not so close um, that they're touching each other and in light competition with each other and in this setting we'll have oaks hickories chestnuts walnuts and maple trees for syrup um, in the understory you can grow crops like wood nettle cut leaf cone flower cutleaf coneflower, uh, may apple, wild hyacinth, wild leeks, um, especially spring ephemeral crops like wild leeks and may apples will be the most productive in this system. Uh, and that's because when you actually go to harvest oaks, hickories, pecans, walnuts, 
and whatnot, um, those trees, you're going to have to mow the understory to uh, have ground harvesting systems for those nut crops. Um, so you can't actually have this thick herbaceous understory the whole year. It has to be mowed in September before the nuts start falling from the trees. And that's why this type of woodland system really promotes early season plants over late season maturing plants. Our drawing here, we have this top block is one acre um, and those circles represent the canopy, the mature canopy spacing on one acre. So I believe we have 15 trees represented here. 15 trees per acre would be a good number for an oak in a slightly dry climate like Arkansas. Whereas if you had oaks in a moister, cooler climate like uh, Illinois compared to Arkansas, then you would go down to about 11 trees per acre. And in the native plant agriculture book, in the woodland section, we actually have math equations that you can use to figure out how many trees per acre for woodland space and you, spacing you would need for your particular climate. Uh, so in this example, we're going to do 15 trees per acre, which is a good number for, as I said, about Arkansas, Tennessee, that kind of warm mid-south climate, um, Virginia. Um, so uh, these could be, once again, the um, blight resistant American chestnuts. They can be uh, various hickory species that we saw on the chart oaks, walnuts, and pecans. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about pecans later and how we can expand their range throughout the north um, and still have them bearing nuts, uh, expanding that uh, valuable nut crop throughout, throughout the east and upper midwest. Um, so I'd like to show you just some real nice open-grown bur oaks. Bur oak is, produces the largest acorn and um, this is, uh, the thing about oaks is um, they need to be selected for annual bearing or heavy biannual bearing. So oaks actually have the potential to be selected for heavy annual bearing. There's a cultivar of swamp white oak called Bucks Unlimited that was bred for deer hunters. And these, this line of swamp white oaks produces acorns each year at a good heavy yield. Um, the thing about these wild crops is they don't have much selection um, done with them. So when you compare them to crops that have been cultivated for hundreds of years or sometimes thousands of years, um, they don't yield as often as uh, old crops. But as you can see with the swamp white oak, cultivar, uh, it's just a matter of putting some effort into selecting the heaviest bearing and most commonly bearing uh, strains within these different oak and hickory and uh, whatnot species, chestnuts. And, but um, with the pecans, you've already seen that they've been selected over the past 100 and 200 years um, to bear heavily every other year. And uh, that's what needs to happen with the other oaks and hickories over time uh, to make them very viable native plant agricultural crops. And when you create this woodland, you're going to create um, basically 10 to 20 percent of the sunlight is going to get in between the trees in its maturity. So um, this little video shows the different insects using cutleaf coneflower. Um, and this is a major understory crop in MPA woodlands that you can grow that is one of the best native plant agricultural vegetable crops. Um, so that 
is one example of a good understory herbaceous plant that could be grown in the maturity of a native plant agricultural woodland. And uh, one other point with a woodland, if you're starting from scratch, um, just open farmland and you're planting one of these native plant agricultural woodlands, of course, these oaks, hickories, pecans, chestnuts, walnuts, they're not going to start producing a good amount of nuts until year 20. Um, so the uh, in the meantime, as these canopies are filling out the space, you would grow, um, you could grow, most likely you would want to go with native plant herbaceous crops or sub thicket, which we'll talk about at the end of the presentation. But these things are like blackberries, raspberries, blueberries, um, sunchokes, ground nuts, spiderwort, common milkweed, and all of these mature and start producing heavy crops after either during year two or after year two. So um, all that time you're waiting for the woodland to grow in, that land is actually productive with other types of vegetable fruit and root crops. So one example of a native plant agricultural woodland crop is the Schumard oak. Um, the Schumard oak can grow in slightly acidic soils, but it thrives in neutral to alkaline soils where a lot of other trees don't necessarily. Um, and they have medium-sized acorns. Acorns are grounded into a flower, and then the bitter part is called tannins. Uh, that's the compound that makes them taste bitter. That's leached out uh, with um, cold water leaching is the most effective when it comes to retaining all the nutrients. So, um, and then the main crops of uh, oaks become uh, products into uh, breads, pastries, cookies, pancakes. It's a flour product, so it gets turned into those kinds of things. Native plant agriculture attracts and supports creatures by restoring native food chains. Gray tree frogs occupy woodlands, native thickets, and herbaceous plant-dominated habitats. These insectivores provide natural control of saw flies, leaf hoppers, leaf beetles, and other insects produced by oaks. The beloved underwing is a type of moth that bases its entire life around oak trees. Not only do they eat oak leaves, the caterpillar of the beloved underwing is colored in green, lime, and rust spots in order to take on the appearance of lichen growing on oak bark. The adult moth is colored in dark splotches, perfectly concealing it against the oak bark where it often perches. The shrew is one of the only venomous mammals in the world, using poisons to subdue its prey. Shrews must consume up to three times their body weight each day and prey on various insects, salamanders, spiders, and even other mice and shrews. This regal jumping spider is capable of capturing flies and other insects by jumping onto them and overtaking them, even high in the canopy of large trees. This regal jumping spider has seized a fly. Cerulean warblers inhabit mature woodlands and forests across much of the eastern U.S., but their population has dropped precipitously since the 1970s. One of the benefits of native plant agriculture is the potential to restore food chains and assist these migratory birds and other species whose populations have been decimated by land use changes. So a few products from the native plant agricultural woodland. In the top left, we have acorn bread. Um, top right, acorn cookies. Bottom left, pecans. Uh, bottom right, um, acorn pancakes. Um, this is a point I would like to make about pecans. Um, pecans naturally uh, range all the way up into Iowa, uh, northern Iowa, along the river. And um, they have native northern populations. And it's these that can bear um, throughout the, uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania, um, all the way to New Jersey and all the way westward uh, to South Dakota. Um, these are the uh, pecans that have to be crossed with each other to make uh, northern fertile pecans. What this picture shows is a selection of northern fertile pecans 
that are bearing north of the Ohio River. Uh, these came from Columbus, Ohio, Indianapolis, uh, Indiana, and Cincinnati, Ohio. And um, all of them have a slightly different shape and a slightly different size, but they all bear well north of the Ohio River. And uh, part of native plant agriculture is expanding the range of pecans because whether or not the pecans are native to uh, Pennsylvania or Northern Ohio, they're still better for ecology than corn, soy, and for the climate than corn, soy, and alfalfa. Um, so you have to keep it in perspective of what's best um, and then because it's a native hickory, a lot of the insects that use you maybe a shagbark hickory in Pennsylvania will still use the hickory, um, the pecan, as if it's a shagbark hickory. Next is um, just shagbark nuts. And the next slide is uh, shellbark nuts. Shellbarks are the largest. Shagbark hickories are more of an acidic soil hickory. And they can grow in neutral soils as well. Um, shell bark hickory can grow in slightly acidic soil, but it prefers alkaline soils. And it's a good indicator of that. So um, the indigenous method of crushing hickory nuts and then boiling, boiling them into basically a milk, it's called po hickory. This is the best, easiest application for hickories, especially for uh, the grower um, that doesn't have the machinery to extract hickory uh, nuts, kernels from hickory nuts at a large scale. Um, replacing things like soy milk and flax milk and dairy milk with hickory milk um, and hazelnut milk. These would be major um, cultural changes, but also industrial changes that would promote native plants over non-native plants in the agricultural sector. And then the interesting thing we have uh, arising with our new technology are American chestnuts that are blight resistant. So um, as these are um, accepted more and more into agriculture, we can bring back a native chestnut crop into the native plant um, agricultural woodland. And one note about yellow bud hickory, uh, Caria cordiformis, also known as bitter nut hickory. It's one of the highest hickory nuts in oil and it has a soft shell so it can be pressed with commercial presses into oil products. Moving on to the sub woodland. The sub woodland is not a actual ecosystem. It's more of a format, an agricultural format that we've created because persimmons and red mulberries are two native plant agricultural crops um, that do not cooperate with the native plant woodland or the native plant agricultural thickets. So they get too large to coexist with thickets like native plums and native hazelnuts. Um, and then they're too small to compete with oaks and hickories um, and walnuts and chestnuts. So we have to create this subcategory for them where they can thrive and mature and have maximum yields without being outcompeted by their neighbors. So um, this format only has two native plant agricultural crops. That's the native persimmon and the native mulberry. If you take a look at this drawing, this is oriented north to south. So on the south side of the woodland, you have the sub woodland um, and that's representing a little bit under one acre right there um, while the woodland is one acre itself. So the sub woodland in this drawing is 15% of the plot and the woodland in this drawing is 30% of the plot. So it's about half as much as the woodland. And this little video just shows the red mulberry. The red mulberry has really large leaves and they're edible. Um, now in certain full sun conditions, they can have smaller leaves. Uh, but this one's grown on a wood edge, so it has pretty large leaves. And this first picture shows invasive white mulberry leaves, and the second picture shows the native red mulberry leaf. 
So the cool thing about native persimmons is um, just like pecans, if you're collecting persimmons from natural northern populations, like there's wild natural northern populations in the southern half of Ohio and uh, southern half of Indiana, Illinois, um, when you collect from those, you're actually going to get persimmons that do not hang on to the tree into the late fall and early winter. When persimmons are hanging on to the trees into early winter, that usually means that their genetics are from deeper in the south and they were brought up north at some point. When they're deeper south, you have a longer fall, you have a longer summer, so those fruits mature and then fall to the ground in those later months when, they're, when it's still somewhat warm. But when you bring those genetics up north, then they don't actually have enough time to mature and they get stuck up in the tree. And uh, sometimes they just stay there until animals pull them down and they're not even fully ripe, so they still have some astringency to them. Here's um, some persimmon pulp product by Rhonda Madison uh, in her food mill um, and some persimmon bread. Those are just two. Um, the persimmon pulp can be made into a lot of different products. And, um, and Austin's going to tell you how uh, persimmon connect with the ecology in this next slide. Luna moths are one insect that host on persimmon trees. They can exceed over seven inches across and are one of the largest moths in North America. Like all giant silk moths, luna moths spin silk and leaves into a cocoon that they overwinter inside. Hickory horned devils are a large caterpillar that also feed on persimmons, as well as hickories, walnuts, and pecan trees, among others. Uh, they appear ferocious, however they are harmless. Canines such as wolves, coyotes, and foxes help control rodents and deter other small animals who may lower yields of native plant agriculture crops if left unchecked. Uh, they will also eat some native fruits, however, since their diet is largely carnivorous, they will not take enough to impact crops in a native plant agriculture format. So let's talk about the thickets format. The thickets format just takes natural occurring thicket species that produce our edible native plant crops and puts them out into rows um, for food production. So with thickets, you have pawpaws, native plums, hazelnuts. You have a native um, chestnut called Allegheny chinkapin. Um, down south, you have a really small persimmon tree called Texas persimmon. Um, which can be planted in the thicket format because it's such a small tree. And then you have a couple of interesting crops where they're actually trees that are coppiced. Coppice means like you let the tree grow up to seven or eight feet, you cut it down at the base, and then it sprouts back up with a lot of different stems. And um, this is going to promote a lot of low growth of foliage for leaf harvesting. And you do that with two native trees, the linden and the red mulberry, to get a lot of leaf production within a harvestable, harvestable range. And then they get coppiced every four to seven years. It depends on the soil conditions and how fast they're growing. You also have thicket cherry, Prunus virginiana, also known as choke cherry. Um, there's probably over 10 native plums that are applicable. So the bulk of this are native plums, which will come in all different sizes and flavors um, when you go through all these different species. And you have elderberry, serviceberry, and another hazelnut, beaked hazelnut, that are applicable to the native plant thicket format. Uh, looking at our drawing, um, thickets, they need uh, like a native plum or native hazelnut needs a good 15 to 17 foot width. Um, so these circles are about to scale 15 to 7 feet wide in diameter. And, um, and then the thickets format here on this drawing is another 30% of the land. So it's taking up that much of the, the plot on this drawing here. And I um, just want to show you a couple of videos. Um, <clears throat> so this is the native thicket cherry um, with the native plums. 
Uh, the cool thing about native thicket species, they are pollinator powerhouses. They bloom at times in wetlands and prairies and savannas where the herbaceous, when the herbaceous layer isn't really blooming. So a lot of these thicket species are going to be blooming in April, May, and June. If you're in the south, you're more so looking at uh, March, April, May, uh, Midwest, April, May, June, upper Midwest, May, June. Um, so uh, they're filling a void within the ecosystem where the herbaceous layer isn't really producing a lot of flowers outside of the forest. The forest does have forest ephemerals during this time, but when you're talking about savannas, wetlands, and prairies, uh, the herbaceous layer is not very productive during these spring months. What is productive are the thickets that are supposed to be in the prairies, in the wetlands, and in the savannas. And having this in abundance on your farm really balances out the whole pollinator community. This last video is just uh, pawpaws showing how large these pawpaw thickets can get in the full sun. So quickly going through here, um, one point about native plums is there is a very wide genetic diversity expression in every species of wild plum. So if you grow out uh, 50 uh, Prunus monsoniana, Shawnee plums, um, you might have 50 slightly different flavors, 50 slightly different sizes, um, and each native plum that is within this species is going to express itself ever so slightly different. And then when you're looking at 50 or you're looking at 100, the range of difference is huge. So just in a patch of seven individual Shawnee plums, these four were distinctly different where you've got the one on the far right being over twice as big as the one on the far left. And the point of this is when you start growing out these native crops and then they're put into agricultural situations where there's less competition, you're going to get these larger fruits than you would find out in the wild. And then you can start selecting these as cultivars and really start upping the yield of native plant agriculture. Here we have some Chickasaw plums. The next slide is common plum Prunus americana. And another picture of common plum, pretty large ones, um, Prunus americana. Here's quapaw plum, Prunus hortulana. They have really glossy fruit, whereas the Prunus americana had a gray coating on the fruit. The quapaw is very glossy. It doesn't have any glaucous coating. Here's some Prunus americana, common plum, uh, cut in half and made into jellies. Um, and a few other um, native plant thicket crops, top left, Allegheny chinkapin, top right, elderberry, bottom left, coppiced red mulberry, bottom right, um, hazelnut butter, uh, top left, thicket cherry, also known as choke cherry um, jelly, top right, service berries, bottom left, aronia, top right, pawpaw. Brown thrashers are a type of thicket bird that are somewhat larger than robins. They generally forage on the ground, under thickets, and among leaf litter, hunting insects like beetles and grubs. Spring peepers are one type of amphibian or reptile that find refuge in wild plum thickets, even in open prairies where they otherwise wouldn't persist. This spring peeper is resting on a plum sucker within the thicket. The reason they're able to survive under the cover of mature thickets is because of the dense branching and canopy of the wild plum. It provides enough shade to retain adequate moisture for them. Red-humped sallows feed on plum leaves, fueling their growth into an adult butterfly. White-dotted prominence are another type of caterpillar that feeds on plum leaves, among other plant species. Caterpillars are a primary food source for songbirds to feed their nestlings. So our second to last format in native plant agriculture is herbaceous and subthicket. So you could almost call this the prairie format, um, but prairies are traditionally dominated by grasses, which aren't really edible to humans. Um, so we call this the herbaceous and subthicket, and what it's mostly are native wildflowers, and subthicket is just 
um, thicket species that are too small to compete with the thicket format. So you have these small thicket species like blackberry, raspberry, currants, those kinds of species included in this format where they can thrive and not be in the competition of tall thicket species. So um, let's run down the list really quick. Um, just the herbaceous and sub thicket has the most species out of all the formats. Uh, you have some native plant agricultural vegetables, roots, and fruits. Um, so you have um, the pasture thistle, which produces an edible root. Purpy, purple mallow poppy um, produces a nice edible root. Uh, plants like arrowhead is another ed edible root and liatris. Um, and then you have some vegetables with the two spiderwort species, Virginia spiderwort and Ohio spiderwort. Um, common milkweed is edible cooked. Um, and then you have amar native amaranth species and chinopodiums, which are mostly used as vegetables. The grains on the wild chinopodiums and wild amaranths, the native ones, are just so small that they would have to be bred into strains to really be worth creating, which someone may do at some uh, worth producing. Um, which someone may do at some point, but for now they're just vegetable crops because you can eat amaranth and chinopodiums just like they're spinach. So they're just leaf crops. Um, and then going forward, you have herbaceous um, and woody vine crops. So you have native grapes, fox grape, which you want to just use the cultivar for now, Concord grape, but we should be able to produce more native cultivars of Vitis labrusca in the future, muscadine grape, is an example of a native grape species that has been given cultivation attention and selected and bred. So you've got tons of muscadine grape cultivars that are mostly applicable um, south of the Ohio River. Then you have um, riverbank grape, which is wide ranging and it's actually a vegetable crop. Um, you can use the fruit, but they're small. Um, they're very nicely lemon uh, flavored, uh, acidic flavored uh, grapes. Um, but um, the veg the riverbank grape is a vegetable crop because the leaf is palatable raw and it just has a lemon flavor without the bite. Passion flower can be either a vegetable crop or a fruit crop. You can cook the greens to make them edible or you can use the fruit, which is a very nice citrusy flavor fruit. Pretty large too, uh, a little bit smaller than a tennis ball. And then you have ground nut and wild potato vine. You also have sunchokes and annual sunflower is a very, you know, agriculturalized native plant uh, crop. So you can get really large seed yields on our annual sunflower cultivars, but those would be applicable as well. And then in the sub thickets, you have beech plum, which is a small northeastern plum that would not be included in the large thickets. It's a sub thicket species. Uh, native currants, gooseberries, blueberries, blackberries, um, black raspberries and American red raspberry and aronia. Now aronia can be included in the thicket format where it grows large enough, but in some areas it doesn't get that large. So it's better suited in the sub thicket and herbaceous format. Looking at our drawing here, um, we've given uh, the sub, the herbaceous and sub thicket, which is represented by those rows at the bottom, about 25% uh, of the land. So this is a very balanced native plant agricultural farm example, where you have the woodland, sub woodland thicket, and then your herbaceous and sub thicket in four different formats. Um, here's a short video of a few native plant agricultural crops. You got a carpenter bee pollinating the spiderwort. And then after that, here's an example. This is a natural example of how sub thickets, how sub thickets and herbaceous operate in the same ecosystem. So this is a native prairie planting. You have black raspberries arising from the native prairie. And then um, we'd like to use Concord grape 
um, which is Vitis Labrusca, Cultivar Vitis Labrusca, as an example of how uh, this herbaceous part of the MPA farm um, supports the ecology of the farm. Gray cat birds often hunt along edges and openings and can frequently be seen exploring grapevines for food. Virginia creeper sphinx is a striking caterpillar that will host on Virginia creeper as well as grape. The oblong-winged katydid eats grape leaves, among other plants, and help form the base of the food chain that supports larger creatures. Let's take a quick 30-second breather and just watch these native insect activity on common milkweed. The common yellow throat is a migratory songbird who nests in thickets and uses common milkweed and other prairie plants as a hunting ground. Common yellow throats feed their babies the bugs they find, often bringing back spiders, bees, and wasps, or various insect larvae, to their youngsters. Monarch butterfly caterpillars require species in the milkweed family to host on. Various types of beetles also use common milkweed as a host plant, including the red milkweed beetle, top center, and the milkweed leaf beetle shown in the top right. Bumblebees, carpenter bees, butterflies, moths, and smaller native bees are among the most commonly supported pollinators on milkweed species. So quickly I'd like to name a few native plant herbaceous crops with pictures. Top left you have annual sunflower, top right uh, sunflower butter. Bottom left, you have the sun choke flowers. Bottom right, the sun choke tubers cut and roasted. Uh, top left, cut leaf cone flower, which can also be grown in the MPA woodland. Uh, top right, um, Ohio spiderwort, one of the two spiderworts. Bottom left, common milkweed, which has so many different kinds of vegetables. The arising shoots can be used as asparagus. The top, the top uh, new growth can be used. The, um, the flower pods unopened can be used like broccoli. Um, the open flowers can be used. My favorite use of them is the pods because if you allow the common milkweed to get to the, um, the stage at which it's producing pods, then you can use the pods as the vegetable crop and that common milkweed will be have allowed to uh, put out all of its nectar and pollen out into the ecosystem. And then in the bottom right, you have slender nettle, which is one of the most nutritional and best flavored uh, vegetables around. Top left, you have the American lotus roots cut into chips. Um, top right, you have the groundnut, Apios americana. Bottom left, you have Liatris spicata grown in a field, production field. Um, the young roots, one to two years old, are edible on the atris piccata, roasted, not raw. Um, and the bottom right, you have arrowwood tubers, which is a wet, native wetland plant. Top left, Concord grape. Top right, muscadine grapes. Bottom left, black raspberries, which they have a few native cultivars developed of. And bottom right, blueberries, which they have a ton of native cultivars developed of. So with this example, we had um, a very balanced MPA farm. And in general, if you're staying within these percentages, percentages, you have a very diverse, lively MPA farm. 20 to 30% woodlands, uh, 10 to 20% subwoodland, 20 to 30% thickets, 20 to 30% herbaceous and sub thicket. And you have to remember, you can put some of your herbaceous and sub thicket into the woodland section if you're starting from scratch, because the woodland isn't going to start to shade out the soil for 20 to 30 years. So you have a lot of years of productivity there on that land. And then lastly, you can devote one to 5% of the land, depending on how big the farm is, one to 5% of the land into the wetland pond aquaculture. So 
our meat production and native plant agriculture uses the most efficient native uh, fish possible. And what wetland, wetland pond gradient means is naturally in glacial kettle lakes, you'll have this slow transition into depth and you'll have about one third of the vegetation is wetland vegetation it's very shallow and then it gets deeper as you get into the center so if you create a pond that has its 20 to 15 foot depth for the holding area and um, for uh, retaining all that oxygen in the midsummer for the fish um, and then you have one third um, of the vegetation as submergent aquatic vegetation like lotus and arrowhead and then you have one third of even shallower wetland vegetation beyond that where like hibiscus would grow and swamp milkweed you can create a lot of biodiversity on your farm and still uh, be producing fish in the deeper parts of the pond situation. So uh, channel catfish and sunfish and perch all have over 50% feed conversion rates. Um, that is compared to chicken, um, a 12 to 13% conversion rate, um, pig 10 to 11% conversion rate, and uh, beef, cow, 1 to 3% conversion rate. When um, uh, when the uh, top three meats are convert or uh, the top three meats that were consumed in the U.S. in 2018, cow, chicken, pig are switched out with catfish, sunfish, and perch. We would need one tenth of the land to create the livestock feed needed to produce the same exact amount of meat. It would just be in the form of catfish, sunfish, perch. Um, so these are the kind of huge efficiency gains we need to curb climate change, to curb biodiversity decline, sequester carbon, and use our land way more efficiently. So native plant agriculture fits our needs. We need to transition from annual agriculture to perennial agriculture to sequester carbon. We need to stop and reverse biodiversity decline. You do that with native plants. There's no other way. The need to increase food production for a changing climate to uh, increasing that land use efficiency by switching out uh, warm-blooded animals with cold-blooded animal uh, agriculture, particularly aquaculture, um, is going to create the type of land use excess you need to grow all of these uh, different MPA crops on cropland. Um, and the need for increased meat production is met through those can, uh, catfish, sunfish, perch. And you can use, um, it's not the worst thing to use non-native fish in aquaculture. Um, this just promotes more native species in the ecosystem uh, over non-native species. So three ways you can help establish native plant agriculture. You can grow native plant crops on your land to share and introduce with your social network. So even if you don't have a lot of land, just growing a patch of native fruit and vegetables and then using them um, during Thanksgiving, July 4th, uh, get togethers with your social network. That starts to introduce the idea of native plant agriculture to the people. Um, supporting native plant food festivals, that's the biggest way. So what Indigenous Landscapes is doing is we're buying land and growing uh, native plant agricultural crops specifically to produce food for food festivals and then we'll hold those food festivals in the fall um, and invite chefs to prepare the food and um, then we'll be able to introduce the whole metropolitan and whoever travels to our metropolitan to native foods and start to build the market for them advocating for and helping local parks and nonprofits to create MPA displays. That's another effective way to start to help establish native plant agriculture in our culture and to keep your eyes on the prize 
this light green land that's we're using for corn, soy, alfalfa um, that's on this map, this is a restoration opportunity. Remember, over 90% of the food fed to livestock is not returned as harvest. Um, and if you average the chicken and cow and pig we ate in 2018, it's 95%. Uh, is not returned as harvest. So we're literally wasting the calories we produce on this land by running it through warm-blooded animals instead of cold-blooded animals and uh, or growing crops that are directly eaten by humans. So this concludes our introduction to native plant agriculture presentation. You can use our website in digiscapes.com it's I-N-D-I-G-E scapes.com to stay up with our um, announcements. And um, for Facebook, the best way to find us is just typing in indigenous landscapes. We have pretty much the most popular ecology page on Facebook. We post three times a day. I mean, sorry, three times a week and um, sometimes four times in a week. And they're usually all educational posts. And if you wanna learn more about native plant agriculture, consider buying the book. You can find this, we just published it in February 14th, I think, of this year, um, 176 page, high quality, glossy picture, paperback. Um, you can find it at indigiscapes.com, and this is volume one, Responding to Biodiversity Loss and Climate Change with Large-Scale Ecological Restoration. Thank you.